purpose and the mission of our museum is to preserve the heritage of this area. The influence that the Little River Railroad and Lumber Company had on the area and to keep the, the memories alive of the things that happened here. The events that led up to the Smoky Mountains dedication as a national park have their beginning in the logging industry. The turn of the 20th century brought change to the peaceful hollows of the Great Smoky Mountains. At one time, the peaceful side of the Smokies wasn't so peaceful. The sound of train whistles pierced the still air of the valleys and hollows. Steam locomotives, clacking of rails, saws turning, and people bustling to and from newfound logging jobs. Logging had arrived. The Little River Railroad and Lumber Company Museum is a nonprofit corporation founded in 1982 to preserve the heritage of the Little River Lumber Company and the Little River Railroad. They operate a museum in Townsend, Tennessee, collecting, preserving, and exhibiting the history of these companies and of the people in this region. My name is Sandy Hedrick. I volunteer with the Little River Railroad and Lumber Company Museum. I currently serve as treasurer of that organization. We see the future of the Little River Railroad being one to continue telling the story about this town and about how this town was changed when the railroad and the lumber company came in. If you can imagine, everyone that lived here were farmers and then all of a sudden they had a job. So. We're able to tell the story of how being able to have disposable income changed this community forever. Townsend was the site of the sawmill and headquarters of this operation, which logged huge portions of what is now the Great Smoky Mountains National Park from 1901 until 1939. The Little River Railroad and Lumber Company Museum maintains a vast collection of photographs. They have photos of trains like the bald ones, chaise, rail cars, and log trains, even passenger trains and train wrecks. There's equipment from logging. There's skidders and loaders and sawmills. There are photographs of the tannery, of construction of the rail, little river scene. There are photographs of the people that helped build this railroad and company. There are photographs of Townsend, Tennessee, and its history as well. Probably the interest of every community have to have its roots known and how the community began and that was of high interest here in this area especially because many of the people that have relatives here had high interest in tracing back their family's lines and so this museum actually came up around that particular emphasis, that thought. In 1983, the original Wallen Depot building was moved to the site and now contains the primary collection of photographs, papers, tools, and other small artifacts. This building was renovated in 1995-96 and new exhibits were created to tell the Little River story. Alongside the depot platform, Museum volunteers have constructed a replica of the Elkmont Post Office. The larger artifacts including Shea 2147, LNN Class NE Little Woody, two vintage flat cars, a portable Frick steam engine, one of the original set-off houses used for logging families in the mountains, a wood water tank that was used in Wallen, and a log loader are displayed on the ground. The Little River became famous far beyond its remote mountain origin, due in large part to its innovations in railroad motive power, which included invention of the first 2442 articulated mallet and the smallest 462 Pacific ever built. Uh, the um, 
The museum is entirely self-supported by donations and contributions and sales of memorial bricks that are set up out front. We're in a continual state of development as we retrieve uh, era, actual equipment from the era and restore it so that it can be available for, uh, for preservation and to visually tell the story. It's a very important story for this area. The last tree was still cut by a saw like that. Heading to Spruce Flat, Fish Camp, Three Forks, going to Elkmont, Lynn Camp, or Tremont, heading out to Jake's Creek or Bent Arm. Words were used such as overhead skitter, steam donkey, slideway, and splash dam, Sari Parker, or Stringtown. It all began when Colonel W.B. Townsend founded the Little River Railroad and Lumber Company in 1901. It came to be one of the largest logging operations in southern Appalachia. The lumber company cut over a half a billion board feet from the Tennessee side of the mountain. It has been said that the Little River Lumber Company employed about 600 people at its peak and numerous thousands throughout its existence. school and middle school kids that come in here and they're absolutely amazed that they cannot believe that we have something like a Shea locomotive and people don't understand what a Shea is. They're used to seeing steam locomotives with the big drive wheels on it and and the ones that have the big rods and they're, they're called rod engines. The Shea's gear driven lo locomotive and the kids will sit there and they'll look at it and they'll, they'll say we don't understand this. And I said, well, think about this. Now, what would be the advantage of having a gear-driven locomotive? And they think a little bit, and some of them will say, well, maybe because it could go real fast? And I say, no, just the opposite. It can't go fast at all. Now, think about this. I always like to refer to that Shea as being the SUV of locomotives. It's an all-wheel drive locomotive. Now think about that. Now what do you think you can do? Think about what you could do with an SUV. You can go just about anywhere. You can go up steep grades, you can go up on bad track, and that's exactly what that Shea locomotive did. A lot of the things that we take for granted today were invented because of the railroad. A lot of the tools that we use, uh, science classes can come up here and we can give a, a really good lesson on simple machines. Uh, leverage and uh, gear reduction and pulley systems was critical in the railroad and logging industry. We had just had piles of uh, artifacts around in here, um, a bunch of old uh, counters from stores and stuff like that, before we redid, redesigned and redid this building. Um, and uh, at that time we had a little gift shop area, which is important to our income. Uh, to be able to sell some things in the gift shop. Uh, so we kind of had to eliminate that because we didn't have room for all these exhibits and a gift shop. A man stopped by who was here a year ago and said, hey, I got a stove for that caboose out there and I'll bring it by. And sure enough, here in, a, in just in the, two days ago, he showed up with that caboose. I mean, with that uh, furnace for the caboose, a little wooden stove, and it's sitting out on the porch. So 
what was the significance of this particular Shea engine? It, it's the only one that was remaining of the Shays that actually worked inside the National Park. We used to have a Chamber of Commerce in Townsend, and at one of our annual meetings, George Morrison and Don Story showed up, and George had learned about this locomotive, which was over at uh, Graham County Railroad. Uh, George found out they were getting ready to scrap the locomotive. In researching, he found out this also was the only remaining Shea that had worked for the Little River Lumber Company in the Smoky Mountain National Park. So that was what started it, and then there were several little meetings around different places. They, they formed the uh, Little River Railroad and Lumber Company as a not-for-profit corporation. <laughs> Then we started figuring out where to get the money. Then the other thing that they was concerned about was where would they put it. At that time, I think we were about ready to give up on it, and Paul Maples offered this piece of land. Uh, that kind of solved the problems to a point. The other one was where would we get the funds to pay for it. So uh, he financed it over a period of time, and I'll be honest with you, I don't remember how long it was. So that was when uh, actually the corporation was formed and we really got active on it and started trying to raise money. George had contacted them and uh, made arrangements for us to get the locomotive. We would go over on Saturdays and start taking parts off of that locomotive, the, the drive gear and so forth, because we couldn't move it with that on. And uh, we did that, I'm, I'm going to say, about every Saturday for six weeks. Jim Goddard uh, was really very active in putting this program together, and I think he was the one that contacted the people at Vulcan Materials and Alcoa uh, Vulcan number one for the low what boy. What is the low boy? What is that? Uh, that is a, a heavy a piece of heavy equipment trailer. It's the one you know that has the dip in it and then the hind wheels come up. They surveyed the best way to get it here. They ruled out 129 because the uh, trailer would bottom out going over the tops of some of those hills. The only uh, other option that was viable was to take uh, 64 across through Ducktown, down of Coe and into Cleveland and pick up Interstate 40, and, or 75 rather, and come up here. You just don't move stuff on Thanksgiving weekend without pulling some strings. And I don't know who pulled those, but anyhow, the governor of North Carolina and the governor of Tennessee signed waivers to allow us to move that stuff. Was that Lamar Alexander? It sure was. Local boy. Yeah. <laughs> that <laughs> and, may be one. And I don't remember who the governor of uh, North Carolina was, but you know, you can figure it out. Jim Goddard, I think, was the one who made arrangements for the somebody over there with a backhoe to go down and dig a ramp so that they could back the low boys in right at the end of the track where this engine was sitting along the highway so that we could tie the rails together and then just pull it right straight on to the low boy and uh, the tank and the caboose went on the other trailer. And it worked as slick as a whistle, but the day we went over there, gosh, we had a bunch of people, even Dean Stone from the uh, newspaper was with us. And I remember we was carrying a rail and uh, Dean wanted to do his part and he grabbed hold of the other end of the rail tong that I had. And uh, there were about six of us on the end of that thing. We moved the rail that we needed to to get it down there. And so everybody participated in it. and. Um, then when we loaded that, then they pulled it out and backed the other trailer in and loaded the, the uh, tank and the caboose on it. And I think it was around 2.30 in the afternoon when we left down.
down there. We got as far as Ducktown, and uh, one of the wheel bearings went bad in one of the trailers. And uh, so it got to smoking and squealing, and they decided they had to fix that before we went any farther. So the option was in, and at that point in time, it was probably around 4 o'clock in the afternoon, it was, they just decided it would be a good time to put up for the night. And of course then the next morning while we got started and went on into Cleveland and up Interstate 40 then on into here. Uh, all the bridges and low hanging wires and things pose problems. But um, Jim Wilsford had his pickup truck fitted with a pole that was the same height above the road as the stack on the engine. And uh, Bob Hammond was riding with him and they stayed in front of us and any time they came to any sort of an obstacle that could pose a problem, they would let us know and we were working with uh, CB radios. And uh, he would tell us, you know, he needed to check the bridge and sometimes we would have to. But we stopped somewhere and I think that was probably down around Sweetwater, the truck stop. And there was a highway patrolman come in after us and I mean, he was out for blood. He wasn't who gave, who gave us the authority to be hauling that stuff on a weekend. So. Uh, I think it was Jim had those permits and he showed them to him, you know, and when you got something with the governor of North Carolina and the governor of Tennessee's signature, you don't say anything else. So, you know, there was a lot of people and a lot of things that had to take place. Jim Goddard got a portable air compressor hooked to the back of his truck. George Morrison had an old steam whistle and he hooked it to the air compressor. And coming up the valley from Maryville up here, he would, uh, <laughs> that air, air compressor couldn't hardly keep enough air going for George to keep blowing the whistle. people, you drive through areas and with this being a national park, you don't think about what existed before the park did. Well, I suspect the first thing that people will learn coming in here is that this national park, uh, beautifully wooded mountains that we have today, is not virgin timber. Uh, many people think that uh, to be this beautiful, it must. this has never been touched. Well, this was mostly clear cut. And so, uh, although there are stands of virgin timber in there, um, companies like the Little, Little River Lumber Company and many on the other side of the mountain in North Carolina did a lot of logging in these mountains before this became a national park. But beyond that, not only that, uh, that straightens out a little bit of the natural history of what you see around here, visitors to the park, uh, but also that um, uh, the park itself um, is, is really kind of an outgrowth of this logging industry because the logging railroad coming in here brought people in deep into the mountains that had never been able to get there before because they could ride the passenger trains. And people became very uh, uh, interested in saving these mountains and eventually creating a national park. When, when school groups come here, what we're going to do is we're going to pick up any number of curriculum items that they could look at, and one of them would be transportation. And we talk about transportation, about how people would go from Knoxville and come up to Elkmont just to get away from the summer heat. Uh, and if you look at some of the pictures that we have of the passengers coming in, I think one of the things that's very significant about that is that they're all dressed up. The ladies are in their fine white dresses and the men all have on suits and ties. Well, I think it's important to, to uh, the area uh, that we have preserved some of the roots. Uh, we have some older people here who are getting well on an age that come by and can reminisce. And I think they feel good that somebody has preserved something of their childhood in their early days when this area was just a simple, hardworking logging and, and lumber town. Uh, and the same thing exists at a lot of places in the country, but I, I think the, the 
saving and, and the equipment and the pictures we have displayed in the museum uh, helps people to understand what life was like 100 years ago. One of our recent visits up in the mountain, uh, we had the opportunity to sit down with uh, local history buff, David Douglas, and uh, he gave us his version of what happened in the mountains and the people from um, some of the areas that we've seen up in Cades Cove and Townsend, over into Elkmont, and many of them that were down in Jefferson County and Sevier County during the uh, TVA construction of the dams in the 1930s. So here it is. Some of the mountain families still live there. 
and all these people were they were dirt poor. They moved them out of the mountains and they came in, in this little, it's a little valley like and it's the nearest thing to the mountains they could get I guess. Where's the Southwest community? It's right below my house there. By the dam? No, it's no, it's right you, you know you're coming you know where that mountain lake ranch is? Mm -hmm. The road's right across from it. You turn on that, that's Southwest Road. I know that. I've seen the signs. <laughs> Sorry, that is so funny. <laughs> well, it's actually very sad, Dan. <laughs> it is really sad. <laughs> it's so funny, the Southwest Road. But to the thing that that the people, my family, used to make fun of these people because they were so poor, and my family was, you know, they were running around in coveralls, but apparently they had socks. <laughs> <laughs> so they got to make fun of the people who didn't. <laughs>